Well, we're continuing our Life Together sermon series, and my heart in this series has been really that our, our greatest impact that we will make on this local church community, um, it will actually be in the way that we love and support and care for one another. It will actually be in the, de- the relationships that we develop with one another. That will be, I believe, our greatest impact in this community. And so we've been spending some time this summer just talking about that. How do we grow as a church community? Did you know that each of you, each of you have a ministry? Raise your hand and just say, yes, I have a ministry. I have a ministry. You don't have to be a pastor. You have a ministry. And actually, uh, the ministry that you have today may not be one that you want, but you've been given a ministry And it's uh, taken from Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Life Together, and it's called The Ministry of Holding One's Tongue. Do you know that you have a ministry, actually, in the way that you use your words? Today, we're going to look at that a little bit deeper. And to help us do that, sometimes we need the uh, theologians of the Peanuts characters, right? Peanuts helps us in all things spiritual. Uh, So we've got the, the slides up here for you, I believe. So we've got Linus, and he's sitting there, and he's kind of noticing his tongue, and his older sister, Lucy, is like, what? And he says, oh, no, not again. And she says, what in the world is the matter with you? And, and Linus says, I'm aware of my tongue. You're what? I'm aware of my tongue. He sticks it out, and he says, it's an awful feeling. Every now and then I become aware that I have a tongue inside my mouth, and then it starts to feel all lumped up. And she says, that's the most stupid thing I've ever heard. He says, I can't help it. I can't put it out of my mind. I keep thinking about where my tongue would be if I weren't thinking about it. And then I can feel it all sort of pressing against my teeth, how it feels all lumped up again. The more I try to put it out of my mind, the more I think about it. She puts her hands up. Good grief. She goes off, oh no, she has started to become aware of her tongue, and she comes back to Linus and she says, I gotta knock your block off. (laughs) Friends, sometimes the battle of holding one's tongue is just becoming aware of how we are using our tongue, aware that we have a tongue and we have a choice on how we are going to use it. And so today I want to ask you a question, and I want you to reflect on this. Are you exhibiting self-control and self-discipline in your speech? Are, or are you using your words, or are you at some times prone to wound others with your words? Ed Sheeran, a famous singer-songwriter, he said, A tongue has no bones, but it can break a heart. How are you using your tongue? And today we're going to look at James, and he is going to call us up as Christians today. Are you ready to be called up? If you are, would you please stand up and hear the word of the Lord from James chapter 3. And he says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, For you know that we who teach will face stricter judgment. That's a word for me and a word for any of us who teach. And then he goes on and he gets general. He says, for all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is mature, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire." The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body. It sets on fire the cycle of life and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature 
can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue. A restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes a blessing and a curse. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. O Lord, let the words of all our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And Lord, even as I pray that, uh, Lord, I'm reminded in, in a very succinct way this week, God, as we pray that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be pleasing. Lord, that there's a direct connection of our hearts to our tongue. And so, Lord, I pray today for all of us that you would, by your grace, really change our hearts, really help us look at our hearts, and Lord, help our hearts to be changed more into your likeness so that our words follow. And so, Lord, we pray this all in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So James, James is a, a book where uh, it, James, the brother of Jesus, He's speaking to the Jerusalem church mainly. He's the senior pastor of the Jerusalem church. And James often gets a bad rap in the church. Martin Luther was one of those theologians who said we should throw it out because it it just talks a lot about that our faith should be made evident in our works. And I think, um, you know, what we need to do is look at James. James is a pastor. He's a leader who wants to call his church up higher. He wants to say, if your faith is real, if you've truly been changed in the heart, then friends, your lives are going to be evidence of this. Your lives are going to show forth the fruit. And if they're not showing forth the fruit, then God has some more work to do on your heart. So James is calling us up higher, and that's what I want to do today. I want to call us up higher as Christians because everywhere around us, politics, social media, relationships, there is a low, low bar of language. There is a low bar of language. And friends, in this environment, we need to be called up to be Christians. We need to be called up to be followers of Jesus who go about the world differently. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So James, I think, is really giving us a high expectation. And first of all, he's saying, I have a high expectation that you are going to exhibit self-control in your speech, that you're going to exhibit self-control. And you know, James, this is one of the things that we talk about, that we are becoming flourishing disciples of Jesus Christ. And so that means that every week And every month and every year and year after year, we should be coming more and more mature in our speech. We should be coming more and more and more mature in our walk with Jesus. And so James says, I expect this from you. I expect that there will be self-control in your speech because if there's not, this is what can happen. And he gave us a huge list, didn't he? He said, look at what can happen if there's no self-control. The tongue can boast. The tongue sets a forest on fire. The tongue is unrighteous. The tongue stains. The tongue sets the whole body on fire. The tongue can set on fire the whole course of one's life. You know, I thought about that. What, What does that mean? Well, if I practice deception, if I practice harming or wounding others with my words, and I just get into that cycle, then my whole life is spiraling into that cycle. Yes, words can set on course your entire life by fire. It says that the tongue is set on fire itself by hell. It says the tongue cannot be tamed. It says the tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Oh my gosh, 
That's a lot of bad stuff, right? But at its best, the tongue blesses God and the tongue builds up and heals. But James, again, he's saying, friends, brothers and sisters, as Christians in the world, I expect you to use your tongue self-controlled. And I think one of the best ways that we can be self-controlled with our tongues is just by doing this. Sometimes, friends, just this. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Life Together is so good on this. He says, look at this quote from him from Life Together. Often, we combat our evil thoughts most effectively if we absolutely refuse to allow them to be expressed in words. Thus, it must be a decisive rule of every Christian fellowship that each individual is prohibited from saying much that occurs to him or her. (laughs) In other words, just because you think it doesn't mean you have to say it. Just because the thought comes to your heads doesn't mean that it needs to come out of your mouths. I read a wonderful book um, for parents called Habits of the Household, and they talk about this for their kids. And um, they have young kids, and they say at the dinner table, you know, they sit down for dinner, and, you know, they lay out the, the dinner table there, and the kids say, well, I don't like this. Well, I don't like this food. Well, I don't like this, and I don't like this. And they've started a new practice in their home just saying, you know, we're only going to talk about, at dinner time what we do like. We're only going to talk about what we do like. So if you don't like something, just don't say it. Just, you don't have to say it. And I think a lot of times we grow up and we think just because we think something that we need to say it. And some, most of the time, we don't need to say it. So take an inventory of your speech in your marriage, in your parenting, on social media. Are you practicing at times just tapping your words? Or... Are you using your words like a sword that thrusts, like lighting a match and setting off a forest fire? We are no um, strangers to forest fires these days, right? Uh, The park fire right now is one of the worst fires that we've had in California's history. Um, in Northern California, burning right now. And I just read very soberly that it is now causing the town of Paradise that was decimated by fire back in 2018. The town of Paradise is having to evacuate. And I just read that the people there in Paradise are, are having trauma over the fact that there's another fire. Can you imagine Uh, And so we need to be praying for our fellow Californians because they've already gone through a devastating fire and here's fire in their backyard. Imagine the trauma. But what really what what is sobering to, to find out reports are that this was a careless act of arson. That some man burned a vehicle and pushed it down a 60 foot embankment into a gully. And the burning car eventually became engulfed, spreading flames into the nearby brush and eventually tearing through nearby neighborhoods. And I just think, oh, that is so careless. It's so destructive. It's so evil. And yet, that is sometimes how we are as followers of Jesus. We just let our mouths go and we cause destruction, we cause devastation in a careless way. So the first question that James wants to really pose to us and call us up is to say, church, family, I expect that you will have self-control in your speech. There will be times when you just keep it to yourself. Secondly, he says, I expect that you will use self-discipline in your speech, that you will use self-discipline. You know, self-control, self-discipline are different uh, scripturally. Self-control is really about holding back your words, what you don't say. Self-discipline is really, as we saw in James, this, the rudder steers. The rudder steers a whole ship. The bridle steers a horse. Well, you can actually direct your words 
for the health and well-being of others. So self-discipline is more of how we choose our words. And the Bible makes it very clear that this is possible for us, that we can actually exhibit self-discipline in our words. Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is one whose rash words are alike sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Wow. So we can actually use our words to constructively build up others. We can actually use our words to bring healing and health and wholeness to others. You know, Ephesians 4.29 says this as well. It says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. You know, friends, the self-discipline question is, are you using your words in a constructive way? You can speak truthfully. You can speak graciously. But are you using your words in a constructive way to build up your brother and your sister, to build up your spouse? to build up your friends? Are you using this in a self-disciplined way? I found this kind of interesting. There's um, a proverb not found in scriptures, but it's an Arabian proverb. And this Arabian proverb says this, that the words of the tongue should have three gatekeepers. Number one, is it true? Number two, is it kind? Number three, is it necessary? So yes, you can speak truth, But yes, you should speak truth graciously and you should run it through this test. Am I using this to build up? Is it kind? Is it necessary? And I think about all the places right now in our relationships where this really gets really concrete. Um, We have such an opportunity to use our words in a a life-giving way. Parents, what an opportunity. What an exceptional opportunity. When you see a virtue in your child, when you catch your child doing something that you just, you're like, yes, they're finally getting it. You know, do you tell them? Do you say, hey, uh, you know, I just want to tell you that I, I just saw you doing this and it just really made, really made my heart happy. Um, you know, do you use your words in, in a way that is building up others? Husbands, when you appreciate something about your spouse, do you tell them? Do you tell them, wives, you can nudge your husband now? Do you, do you let them know? Friends, in your deepest, closest relationships, when you see something you admire in another friend, do you let them know? Do you just say, hey, I, I really admire this about you. I've seen this in your life, or I've seen how you're growing with Christ, or I've seen the way that you, uh, you're being wise about your, you know, spending your money or whatever it is, and, and I just want to say I really appreciate that about you. Um, you can direct your words in a life-giving way. Another way you can direct your words, very concrete, very practical, is a person comes to you with some juicy gossip, right? Some juicy gossip. They say, well, so-and-so did this, or so-and-so this, and this, and this, and this, and negative, 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 and this, oh, and I heard this, and this, and this, right? You know what you can do, actually, is you can use your words to direct that a different way. You can say, you know, I think this is something that you should talk directly with so-and-so about. You don't have to listen to it. You can direct that person to go directly to the person that they have an issue with. That's maturity in Jesus Christ. Friends, James, the brother of Jesus, learned a lot from Jesus, and he expects that we will use our speech in a self-controlled, self-disciplined way. Now, That's our relationships. Now, we have an amazing opportunity to practice this right now in an election year. Everybody take a deep breath, all right? Just get it out. An election is coming. We have an opportunity to grow in wholesome speech in an election year. In our politics, On our social media, it is vitriol, it is violence, it is harshness. And I get it. I'm passionate about certain truths. I'm passionate about certain values. There's things that irk me 
Um, I'm upset that uh, I was excited about watching the Olympics and here the opening ceremony is just off the charts, just, you know, horrible. Uh, drag queens and all kinds of nonsense. That hurts me. I'm irked about that. There's a lot of things in politics or a certain political candidate that I'm irked about. But let me tell you this, friends. We have to model as Christians a different way than the vitriol, than the harshness, than the anger, than the violence. So if someone comes to you and says, you know what, Donald Trump is a blankety blank, 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 and how could anybody ever vote for that blank, 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 blank? Are you going to then get right into that and start lighting a fire? If someone comes to you and says, you know, Kamala Harris, she's a blankety blank, blank. I just can't believe blank, blank, blank. Those people, blank, blank, blank. Are you going to stoke the fire? RFK Jr., he's a blankety blank, blank, and blank, blank, and all those this and all those that, and all they ever do is this and that. Friends, are you going to light a match and start the fire more, or are you going to say, hold on? I'm going to pour some water on this right now. You know what you can say? You can say, you know, thanks for sharing your views. I actually feel differently, and here's why. That's simple. You can speak your views. You can speak your values. You can speak what God has put on your heart in a, in a constructive, gracious way. You don't have to battle with words. You can just say, thanks for, thanks for sharing. I feel differently. Here's my perspective. Friends, this is the kind of civil discourse and mature Christian talk that we need to exhibit, especially in an election year. Amen. Okay, I got one amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I know it's hard, but we're gonna, we'll talk more and more about it. But friends, the way that we use our words in self-controlled ways and in self-disciplined ways really matters. Because at the heart, what our words show is what is in our hearts. And this is the deeper truth. So yes, I want you to be aware of your tongue and how you're using your tongue, but I want you deeper to be aware of where your heart is at. Because fundamentally, our words are issues of the heart. And this is where James uses that spring metaphor. And he says, you know, a spring gushes up. Can fresh water and salt water be together? There's a source of our words. And Jesus says this. He tells us exactly where the source is. He says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So for out of my heart is really what comes out of my mouth. There's a direct flight <laughs> All of us like direct flights, right? I just went back from Ohio and I got stalled in Chicago a couple times for weather. Everybody loves a direct flight. Well, there's a direct flight from your heart to your mouth, a direct line, direct course. What is in your heart will come out in your words. And so if there's sin in our hearts, which all of us struggle with, anxiety, hatred, fear, pride, selfishness, hypocrisy, lust, deceitfulness, these are actually not born in our mouths. They're born in our hearts. And I love what this one person said who's a professor. He said, our words simply give our sins a public hearing. <laughs> our words simply give our sins a public hearing. And so words reflect the state of our heart, and our heart, more than anything else, reflects the state of our walk with God. So what do we do? How do we find help with our tongues and our speech? How do we grow as mature disciples of Jesus Christ? We look at Jesus. We sit with Jesus. We learn his heart. If words come from our heart, then we, our hearts, need to be changed in the likeness of Jesus Christ. And again, you and me, I'm putting myself <laughs> into this as well. You and me are called up higher. We are called to be mature disciples of Jesus Christ. 
There's nothing really I'm picking on in particular. Um, it may feel like that, but I'm just sensing from this scripture that, man, what an opportunity we have as a church family to be different, to love and do life together in a different way. And I started thinking about, well, Jesus, if, if my heart needs to be changed by you, then what, what were you like? What were your words like? And I, and I just started to worship, and I started to just love Jesus even more. Because I remembered a story when this woman came to him, caught, caught in unfaithful adultery. And all her accusers were just running her down. You've done this. You've done this. You've done this. You are this. You are this. And Jesus pulls her up. And he says, woman, what, what are they saying? And then he talks to the, the leaders and he says, okay, I got it. I see your accusations. Well, who of you can, has no sin in your hearts? Then you cast the first stone. And so they all mm, mm, mutter, you know, <laughs> go away. And Jesus is there with this woman. And here he has an opportunity. How's he going to use his words and he talks to this woman and he says, woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? And she said, no, Lord. And he said, well, neither do I. So go and sin no more. You see, Jesus had every opportunity to accuse her, to run her down, to fuel the fire. But instead of setting her on fire with his words, he set her free. He spoke a word of healing. He spoke a word of truth. He spoke a word of grace. And it changed her life. I can only imagine it changed her life. Does this describe the kind of grace you use in your speech with others? When someone has offended you, do you offer forgiveness? Do you speak forgiveness? Do you work it through? I thought of Jesus and the way he also talked to his disciples. Right? His disciples are always... They're always messed up. They're always, you know, fumbling, stumbling like us, doing the wrong thing, trying hard, and then stumbling. And Jesus says this. He says, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. And I've chose you. I've appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. This is my command. Love each other. See, Jesus used his words to build up his friends. He said, I have confidence in you. I know you don't have confidence in yourself, but I have confidence in you. I know you don't believe you can be forgiven, but I forgive you. I know you don't feel you have purpose or a calling, but I'm giving you a calling. I'm appointing you. I'm speaking words of life into your heart. And some of us need to hear Jesus speaking words of life into our heart today. Jesus had every opportunity when he was cornered by the Roman authorities, right, to defend himself, to cry out. But it, Isaiah 53 says, I love this, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Friends, so much, I, I am convicted you know, oftentimes in my closest relationships, I can take things personally or, or feel cornered. And Jesus was cornered in the worst of ways. And he's silent. He didn't raise his voice in the streets. He just was silent. Friends, this is the way that Jesus uses his words. And he's actually used his words in your life. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in your weakness. So much of Jesus' words have built us up, and, and he will continue to build us up. And then lastly, I started to go a little deeper, and I started to ask, Lord, well, yes, I want to be changed by you. I want to have your words in your heart. I want to speak, God, like you would speak, like Jesus would speak, encouragement, constructive encouragement, building others up. But God, sometimes my heart has been so wounded by other people's words. 
And I think there's some here today maybe who've been wounded by someone's words at some point in your life. Maybe someone said something to you in your childhood. Maybe in a moment of weakness, this person wounded you with what they said. Maybe you have longed for the affirmation of a parent or you've longed for the affirmation of a spouse or a friend and words that should have been spoken were never spoken. And I remembered that when we have hurt in our hearts from other people's words, that often will cause us to hurt others. There's a a phrase, you've probably heard it, that hurt people hurt people. And so today in this moment, I just want to allow you some time and space to say, Jesus, there's been times where maybe my heart has been hurt by someone else's words, and it was painful. And I want to allow Jesus just to shower you with his grace. I believe Jesus wants to stop that cycle of a forest fire that's been going on. You've been mulling over that, or you've been ruminating over those words or you've been wounded and Jesus wants to pour water on your heart today and Jesus wants to bring healing and health and wholeness. He really wants to heal our hearts so that we will be people who will speak his truth, his love, and his grace.